It'll open. There's a toilet at home. There is a toilet paper there. And if you look in the mirror and say candy man for your dog. You're on your own. I'm just saying. I can't. I'm sorry. Oh, 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 Times, right? There's a full moon on the horizon, so let's not. Okay, so there's a bathroom that it does lock on the inside, so don't worry. We'll open it the next time. Um, we're also live streaming. If you guys are not okay with that, any of the star tells anybody, let us know. Just let us know. Matt and Terrence are also going to be taking photos, so just Matt. Just Matt. What? So let us know. Yeah. <laughs> let us know if you're okay with that. Um, and then the theme of the night, like we were saying. He's also going to be tweeting, so he'll tell, he'll take a grab a line from your story and use it with your photos. So if you don't want that to happen as well, that's absolutely fine. If you want the live stream turn off, that's absolutely fine. At least somebody once a month says that you know I don't feel comfortable with this being all over the internet. My mom might be watching next week. Sorry. So the theme of tonight is Star Wars. Yes. Yeah. Sanctuary, refuge. What is your sense of home? Sanctuary, refuge. Is sanctuary a feeling, state of being, mind over matter? Is it literal, physical, metaphysical, theoretical? Has your sense of home ever been threatened, violated? Have you ever feared displacement? How did you make home again? Did home make sense anymore? Did your language change? So the four storytellers that we have tonight, we say, go with whatever interpretation you want of it. So my two storytellers are Nicholas Powers, Yay. and Lloyd Lawrence in the back, Yay. and my two wonderful storytellers are Miss Angela Brown, Woo. and Miss Siobhan Bell. Um, and that leads us to our first storyteller of the evening, who's going to give us her interpretation of Sanctuary and Refuge, Miss Angela Brown. Woo. Generations have been in the same church. The parents got married there and I grew up there, so it's something that holds a lot of different memories for me. And, uh, and now that my mom has passed away and she wanted her, her ashes <coughs> excuse me, to be put in the church. So that's something that's another, another connection for me. Um, for me, sanctuary is not just four walls, it's not just what's contained in four walls, but that part does does matter. Um, I'm thinking of um, the first time that my sense of home felt threatened. Um, that's when my mom and I were evicted. Mm -hmm. And I was young, I was around 10. So it was a time where I had no clue what was going on. What are the, the larger forces that, that make something like that happen? How do you live somewhere and then the next day is not your home anymore? So that was really jarring just because I was too young to understand. Uh, the money, like looking at the gentrification, it's a bit like so much of how we feel safe is like motivated by money and who has power and resources. So I'm thinking like, you know, back then it was just like knowing that we had to leave and thinking of the things that were on our door. Like wrapping paper on the front door at Christmas time, or 
Halloween wreath or something, and now there's an eviction notice. Like there's something telling us that someone else is telling us that that's not our space right now. Very, very hard, very frustrating, and it made me feel powerless. So, it was my sanctuary then, it was my family. Because thankfully, we weren't in the street. We were able to stay with family until we could find another place of our own. But even that, staying with family, being a guest in someone else's house also has its strain, right? Even as people are welcoming you and, and embracing you, there's still sometimes that tension because you know that it's temporary. You don't want to be a burden and trying to, we're trying to keep our our routine of work and school and trying to not be overwhelmed, but still like we have to find a place of our own. Having to be, uh, oh, I'm from Harlem, by the way. That's going to come up later. <laughs> um, I'm from Central Harlem, raised there for most of my life, and I still live there. I'm willing. <laughs> Gentrification, again. <laughs> so I'm holding on to that. But, um, uh, you know, we, had, we ended up having to stay really far away. So still having to do the school routine and work and homework and having to keep up the normal thing but not being in a normal place was, um, was rough. But the sanctuary, the thing that made me feel protected was being with my mom and just her strength and, um, and her positivity, really. So, Fast forward and you know, feeling grateful that we can move back into Harlem and continue to grow up. Um, so fast forward to current times. Um, well actually let me backtrack. One of the things that also was my sanctuary when I was younger was school. Um, I always enjoyed school. I felt that's an that was another safe space. If you didn't get a chance to listen to the interviews in the exhibit, one of the I was listening to was from an art teacher who talked about how art class was a, a great place for her students to let their feelings out. Um, in this, in the, in light of all that's going on in the neighborhood, they don't always feel like they don't always feel safe. So it's nice to have a place where they can um, where they can express themselves. Um, so school was also that for me, and now as a teacher. I, I hope to have that kind of same setting for my kid. Um, let's see. Another thing that, um, that can make the sanctuary and refuge for me is um, is now living in Central Harlem and having seen all the changes that have gone on. Um, I went away to school. I went to school in Western Massachusetts, a big change, big change of scenery. And it was great, but every time that I came home, something was different. What happened to that restaurant? Or what, where did that for sale sign come from? Or why is the rent, you know, hiking up? And there's that, there's that feeling of home being threatened again. Um, and going to different tenant meetings and seeing what people in the neighborhood were, um, what they were facing and what they were feeling. Um, that, you know, that it wasn't just us. And now that I'm, Learning more, you know, having to travel throughout New York and hearing other people's stories. I know it's not just Harlem. Clearly, it's Brooklyn, it's Inwood, it's the Bronx, it's so many places, and then of course outside of outside of New York. So it's just it's interesting to just relate to other people, um, even though we're in different places, we're facing some of the same some of the same struggle. Um, one of the things that helps me even as you know, I hope to stay in Harlem and stay as long as I can. Um, one of the thing that, things that helps me is just staying involved in events going on in Harlem. If there's a new place, I want to be there <laughs> because I'm not trying to get left behind. Right? So mm -hmm. Sometimes when, um, when new places and fancy hip places come along, as, as someone who's been there for a long time, I feel a little left out. And the sense of displacement makes me feel like I'm a stranger in my in a place where I'm from. <laughs> so one thing that I try to counteract that is just be in it, be in the mix. So 
Um, also, what helps me is art. So, um, poetry, singing, those kinds of things are a waste for me. Those are some of my outlets to talk about things I noticed in my thing. So, a song that I've been uh, performing and working on in the past year or so, um, doesn't have a name, but it was motivated by an interview or by a news story about Harlem, a, uh, a region of Harlem known as uh, Noha, and Soha, so North Harlem and South Harlem. And I just, I'm like, no, that's not, that's not cutting it. Um, like, to make it that, that safe part or designate this special part of Harlem. No, it's just fun. If you're here, then be part of what's going on here and don't try to make a, you know, an elite section. So, um, I, I was looking for instrumentals. I found a Joe Scott low brain instrumental, you know. Um, but even that doesn't matter. Even without the music, uh, you can get the I sense. No, no, it no it's, it's okay. okay. I'm, I'm going to turn it. Thank no. you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> things grow and change, that's just the way. Doesn't have to mean we get this place anyway. Come into my space, want to stay for a Now you're trying to change my name. Oh no. I've been here before, been here before. Money talks are them say, loud sounds saying nothing profound. Walk around where I stay, some Columbus trouble trampled in my hometown. We ain't forget, the folks are still scared to get off the train above 96. <laughs> <laughs> You're acting brand new, but we're not new to this. Things grow and change, that's just the way. Doesn't have to mean we get this place that it breaks. Come into my space, want to stay in play. Now you're trying to change my name. Oh no, I've been here before. I've been here before. I've got love for home streets, love for Home streets, love for home streets. You love for home streets, love for home streets, love for home streets. It's in my roots, in my truth, family and memories of my youth. Going further back to made a lift, made a way, made a art, made it through. We persevered, resilient, we built it through the years and the triumph and the tears. Yes, we're still here. Pretend I can't see, but with vision, it's clear. Things fall and change, that's just the way. Doesn't have to mean you get this place that it breaks. Come into my space, won't mistake your plan. Now I'm trying to change my name. Oh no, I've been here before.
who resonate with me and Angela, I, I feel you because I feel like you are a sanctuary. There's a calmness about you that requires people to listen in order to absorb you and to get all of those nuances. And that is one of the reasons why I chose you for tonight because I wanted to know more and hear more and thank you. I appreciate it. There's a break between four storytellers, mm -hmm. but um, at the break, usually they have a next month's um, team for you, and sometimes we pull people from the audience that want to tell stories, it's like at least half of the people that have come here, or maybe like 40% have at some point come back and told a story, so I know you might have said that, but if you were going to forget, I got you. Thank you. You got us. Dad. Got us. Thank you, Granddad. <laughs> <laughs> Burning Man. 
Uh, who here wants a Puerto Rican Star Wars story? I know. Who wants the masturbation story? It's almost equal. It's almost equal. We hit the count. It's almost equal at all. Huh? No it's it's masturbation. Not. No judgment. Y'all still look at that song. Masturbation wins. Okay, it's masturbation. I'm sorry to be pregnant. Um, okay, masturbation. Is she listening over there? Okay. Which one did you put for? Gotcha. Okay, um, as a boy, I often thought I was sleeping on my G.I. Joe figurines. Because there would be this kind of hard thing that I kept rolling over in my sleep. <laughs> And I would wake up and frantically try to clear the bed off of the G.I. Joe figurines. And then whipping over the blanket, I would see there was a pup tent in my pants. And I was scared shitless. I was terrified because this is the one thing that could drag me to hell. If, if I touched this raging childhood heart on, it would be like... It would be like slipping a hand up a nun's dress or touching the inside of the loincloth on the Jesus crucifix. He always looks so sad. I thought he had a happy ending to make him happy again. But um, I would look at my childhood heart on and be like, oh, don't touch it because masturbating is a sin. At least that's what the Catholic priest told me. And they wouldn't know more than anyone else. <laughs> so... <laughs> um, it always makes me wonder why the Jesus loincloth was so like polished and everything else was like that. That's funny. You guys asked for this. You asked for this. You asked for this. Alright, so I was a kid and I was I was actually afraid of my own heart ons because I was worried that if I touched it, if I played with myself, if I consummated pleasure, that that was gonna be a sin. And one sin was enough of a weight that was tied to your soul. So that when you passed away, that single sin, even if it was just half a sin, a quarter of a sin, one-fifth of a sin, would be enough to drag you into the depths of hell. And hell was a boiling inferno of flames leaping up miles high, people being boiled alive, skin bubbling, demons with sharp teeth bedding into your neck and ripping you up like a Thanksgiving turkey drum. I was terrified of hell and I was terrified of sin and that made me terrified of masturbation. <laughs> so, but it was a struggle. It was a struggle because the because the heart would come at, at random moments. You wouldn't know. You were just playing baseball and you didn't know which bat to swing. Um, <laughs> you were like soaping yourself in the shower and warmth and so good, and it was almost, and all of a sudden you're like, uh, and you're like, uh, you tried to wash it, but without pleasure. I don't want to wash it. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, people, you know, there were boys on in the other stall, I'm sure, who had holes drilled into the soap and were spinning it like a World War One airplane. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so I was, I was scared of my own heart, and I, but I really, I was, it was, but the few times that I was brushing it, it felt so good. And I thought, how can something so good? be sinful. Um, so I became a little bit of a scholar and I'm looking through the Bible and I'm like, where does it exactly say right, that masturbation is a sin? And I'm looking at what Jesus said, so here I am, like, I'm, you know, and it, and it felt like I was a detective looking through like, like cold, cold cases, you know? And, and I didn't find anything. So you know, I began to ask um, others, adults, I was like, do you know exactly where it says that it's it's a sin to masturbate. Um, and some of them looked at me like, it's never a sin to masturbate, but they couldn't say it. They could definitely be accused of like child molestation vicariously, you know? Like you can't encourage a kid to masturbate. So, you know, I was looking around and so finally, of course, um, um, I would ask other, other boys, I was like, is it a sin to masturbate? And they would just be like, not for me. <laughs> and so I felt for it. And so um, there was a struggle between the pleasure of the moment and the feeling that the pleasure of the moment could lead to 
uh, destruction of my soul in the afterlife. <laughs> um, now, I didn't realize that uh, at the time, I experienced religion mostly as fear. And I didn't realize until much, much decades later, it was actually a form of like mental child abuse. In other words, like you're scaring uh, young boys and girls away from their own body. And it's easier to control them that way. Um, but I didn't know those words, you know, mental abuse, child abuse. All I know uh, was that I was deeply, deeply, you know, conflicted. And um, I remember one night, finally the dam broke. I was laying in the bed and I was looking at the walls. And and I kept, I had this image that if I, you know, and there was a pup tent. And I knew I wasn't a G.I. Joe figure, and there it was. And it looked like this holy mountain, and I just wanted to climb it. And I kept thinking that if I touched it, Jesus would, like a jack of the <laughs> pop up at the foot of my bed. And then the walls would blow open, and I would see those great fires of hell burning into the sky. And then Jesus would grab me by my clothes, my pajamas, and drag me into hell. And, and, he, and the whole time, he would not stop looking sad. <laughs> that was the worst part, right? And so, and so my hand was like there, and it was so close, and it was, it was getting, it, it, and I could almost feel the heat, like the blood was like in my cock, and it was like, and I could feel the heat going, and it was just like, it was like a campfire, like singeing, and you were like, getting close, and you are like, no. And then, finally, nature was stronger than religion, and I grabbed the steering wheel. <laughs> like I'd seen, you know, top Tom Cruise doing Top Gun, and I just grabbed it. And, and I was just like, fuck Jesus, fuck Jesus, fuck Jesus, fuck Jesus. <laughs> and so I hear him masturbating for the first time, saying, fuck Jesus, fuck Jesus. And the orgasm was satanic. It was so <laughs> good. And then the fires flew further into hell. And I was just like, yes! <laughs> um, but of course, I was, it was, I was too young to actually, like, actually have liquid cum. So like all of that great muscular effort, I was like, sweating. And the only thing that came out was like, <laughs> <laughs> it was a very vigorous, <laughs> but that's all it was. There was no like, you know. And so afterwards, you know, I had shaved my cock. There was like an imprint in my hand. It looked like a fossil. Um, and it was like two o'clock in the morning. I don't know how it was two o'clock in the morning, but I just knew it was that time in the night when nothing else is alive except your thoughts. And I was looking around and I was waiting for Jesus. I was like, right, it was worth it. Just come save me. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Jesus didn't appear. And I was just like, hmm, maybe he's late. So I waited for like two weeks, and but it felt like almost like my cock had like its own like persona. And I was like, come on, he didn't show up. And I was just like, well, maybe he will. Maybe he's playing hide and go seek, and he's waiting until I touch it again. Like, See, I caught you. <laughs> but um, I masturbated again, but Jesus still didn't come. Just me. Just didn't come. Just me. And eventually, I worked my way through my fear. And I was on my career. Self pleasure. And it was beautiful and great. And thankfully, you know, this happens very young, so it's not like I lost a lot of time. Um, <laughs> but I began to doubt God. Uh, so pleasure for me was connected with doubt. The doubting of orthodoxy and pleasure to me was connected with the doubt of ideology. Um, anytime someone came to me with that kind of serious voice, like this is the truth and this is what these ideas will lead you to salvation, whether it's Marxist ideas or religious ideas, or um, I always uh, instantly my body remembered that first feeling of pleasure, of taking doubt and using doubt as a way to open up the. Uh, crevices of those ideas to the reality that they tend to obscure on the other side. And so um, I began to doubt a lot of things in in the Bible and about God. Uh, to the point, um, I was in a, a park and there was like these stone steps and I was looking up at God and I was like, fuck you, God. And I was waiting for the lightning and I was like, fuck you again. And I was like, fuck you, God. Nothing. And I began to suspect that the sky was empty. Um, and that there was nothing actually there. And um, I began to feel freer uh, with myself, but not just with my sexuality and pleasure, but I began to be freer in my thinking. Um, and I began to be suspicious of so much of what I was being sold as a child. And it made me a bit of a weird child. So, 
other people were being sold sports shirts and sports teams, and they said, this is the way to be a young, a cool boy. And yet, I couldn't help but think that everyone just looked the same. Um, I saw, um, as I you know, got out of high school and, and I uh, went into college, um, I remember going into the, the library at the college and they had a poetry section right next to the mm -hmm. physics section. Mm -hmm. And so I had these big towers of books with octavio uh, pads on one side and I had these beautiful illustrated Hubble telescope photos, uh, photo books on the other. And I just began to just feel like I could float away from you know, this world of ideology and religion. Um, the other time I would say masturbation uh, saved me from, uh, oh, uh, from not, not from religion, but from homophobia. So I was in college, and uh, the, the high school I came from was really religious and also like you know, homophobic, um, to the point where some of the kids uh, who acted out their desires and were found out they were beaten up uh, and, and kind of chased out of the school. And so I came out of that school deeply homophobic and I met my friend Brad. And I kind of instantly fell, not in sexual love with him, but almost like a, like a sibling love. For some reason, our minds just linked up. And he was like the brother I never had. And so we would smoke pot together, we would do mushrooms together. And um, I remember one time, um, Boston at that point was still like, you know, very, you know, like people getting beat up in the street for being gay. He was going to a Dragtoberfest. And he asked me, um, could I walk him to this drag slipper fest? Now, he wasn't a very good drag queen, you know. He didn't shave his legs, and these prickly spider legs were sticking out of his hosiery. He didn't really shave, so he had like this like, stubble beard. Um, but, you know, he had his wig and he had his lipstick, and so this like horrific queen was like walking the streets. <laughs> and I held his hand. I had these like long dreads, and I looked like very scary and militant. And I could see in the people's faces as they looked at him that they wanted to. They wanted to beat him up. And the only thing that stopped them was that I was holding his hand, which itself was kind of confusing. So uh, he went to the drag show. I waited. I got a couple of Guinnesses at the, at the bar. He came back. I picked him up, and I walked him back. And I was a little bit buzzed at the time. And I went back to my dorm room, and I took um, the Quran, uh, the Bible, and a couple of other books, uh, like New Age religious books, and I threw them all into the trash. And later that week, uh, he told me about his, this really hot young man that he had met. He was young too, so it didn't matter, like this hot boy that he met. And we went, we all were hanging in his apartment. I was looking at, at the movie Basquiat on TV. And then Brad and his friend were in bed and they were kissing and then they got quiet. They were like, you know, like quiet, right? And then Brad was like, Nick, we really want to fuck, but you look real comfortable <laughs> watching Basquiat. And I was like, look, it's fine. Just fuck. <laughs> and so I was watching them and I was hearing like, the best spring school. You know, and they're like moaning and kissing. And, like, and of course, you know, Brad being Brad, he was like, Nick, do you want to join? I was like, I'm really, I'm good at watching about to be Yeah, <laughs> Brad, he's, he's oh, Brad. Awesome. And, uh, you know, they were moaning and they were getting loud, so I had to turn the thing up loud. Um, and, then, uh, and then I heard them come. And they're like, whoa! And I was like, and I was like so Brad comes, he, he, Brad actually said, that he goes, whoa, especially when it's, when it's someone who he thinks he doesn't deserve to have sex with. Because sometimes Brad gets lucky and he hooks up with someone who's like, who he thinks is like out of his league. And so when he gets that and he comes, he's like, whoa! Um, so anyway, um, you know, I, I, I looked over, I was like, are you guys okay? You doing good? And they were just like covered in slick, you know, and dripping. And and I was like, you guys need a towel or anything? They were like, no, we're fine. And I was just like, cool. And 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 then Brad started, oh, the, the young man, uh, Joe, and it's funny, Joe had like a slightly like half paralyzed lip. And Brad said it, it made his cock sucking skills incredible because he had this like one half paralyzed lip. So it gave this extra like twist to it. Um, so he started jerking Brad off, and Brad is like a fucking horse. He's like humongous. And so it was like taking a long time. <laughs> um, and I was like, good job, guys. You know, and then I just kept watching the movie. And masturbation saved me at that point, not my masturbation, his masturbation saved uh, me from homophobia because when I saw Brad's face, it reminded me of my face. 
you know, when I was in total pleasure and communion with my lover. It was literally the same exact space. And this is my friend who I've who been, you know, hanging out with and talking with and smoking with for, you know, almost like a year and a half. And I, and our faces had mirrored each other so much on so many journeys and trips and conversations that when I saw that, I couldn't help but feel the pleasure that I had felt because I could see the pleasure on his face. And so it, it was one thing to say that I'm politically against homophobia, but to say that I actually could celebrate gay pleasure on my post-orgasmic friend's face and, re and also feel the memory of orgasms I had in my body because I saw it on his face, that demolished it. And that's when I went from just being politically against homophobia to actually saying gay pleasure is awesome. Because it's, it's my pleasure too. It's all pleasure, right? So that was the second time. Um, um, the third time, um, and the, the last part of the, the, the this story was just, thanks live stream. Um, the, last part, the last time um, Dad. masturbation <laughs> saved me from um, not religion and not homophobia, um, but from, uh, from depression. Um, so I had a, uh, I, I, I met um, one of the great loves of my life at Occupy Wall Street. Um, we were there, you know, protesting and chanting, and then late at night, again, like at two o'clock in the morning, the only thing that's alive is desire. No, the only thing that's awake is desire. Um, so I saw someone, it looked like a statue, but it was breathing. And so I gently opened it up, and there was a young woman there, and she was writing poetry. And I was like, oh, can I join you? And she's like, I was waiting for you. And she had this way of talking in kind of like half mystical parables that wouldn't let me, would, would make me feel like I wasn't quite in reality, but I was in a much more enriched reality. And so we sat down and we just started doing spoken word with each other. And we just talked for the next like five hours. And our minds interlocked. And it seemed that this kind of unconscious telepathic voltage was running between um, our, our bodies. And so uh, we fell into this passionate love. And so that even after the police came in and brutally beat people out of Occupy Wall Street all over the country and even the world, we were on this like sugar love hot. And so we would uh, go to the roof and we would jerk each other off on the roof. And so, um, you know, she would straddle a chair, you know, just to get the clip really nice and open. And I would go from behind her and she and I, and then she would reach off and jerk off. And then we'd watch the sunrise together. And we'd always try to time it for the sunrise, you know? Now, it was a little bit of a spectacle, but it was also like, we did it during the weekday, so no one was really awake at that time, right? Um, and so here we are, these two people just, like, just fucking it off. And at first we were shy, we would have a poncho, so we would put like a poncho over, right? And then after a while, we're like, fuck the poncho! We we're like, yay, freedom! Um, and uh, so we had this, we would share poetry, we would share thoughts, we would go on protest together. Um, she suffered from a, a depression, and um, when I came home one night, everything that she had owned and she had dropped at my place was gone. And I asked a friend, where, where was she going? She's like, oh, she's at a hospital. She tried to kill herself. So my whole world just instantly just collapsed, and I ran over there, and you know, she was shaken, and she was on like those medications, so there was like a fog in her eyes. You know, and so where before I felt that voltage, it was as if the pain medication to save her life uh, had to kill her, her mind a little bit, right? So eventually they thought she was safe enough to let out. And um, I brought her back to the apartment, I took care of her as much as I could, um, and then eventually she, she said she had to go. And so she left, and I didn't hear from her for a long, long time. I did hear from other friends that she tried to kill herself another time, and it failed. And in my head, I knew that one day I was gonna get a phone call. And I did. Last year, last summer, I got a phone call. And it was her best friend. And, she, and I could tell in the very first sounds that she was gone. But it took a couple of minutes for her to actually say. And so she said that she had committed herself with pills, just like her mother had killed herself with pills. And so it seemed to be a, uh, she had inherited from her mother a bipolar kind of chemistry that, uh, that swung her so far back and forth from um, living in this kind of shadow zone where everything actually did, she couldn't even feel anything, so she felt like numb, to this other place where she felt like an ecstatic ball of light. And she just couldn't 
deal with the swinging back and forth anymore. Mm -hmm. And the people around her couldn't deal with it. And so sometimes one by one they would leave until there was no one left for her to hold on to. Except other people who were just as unstable as she was. So um, I heard that and instantly I felt this grief and, uh, and sadness. And um, I went to Burning Man to Occupy, I went to Occupy Wall Street to Cotty Park where I first met her under that, that kind of tarp. And I just wept these long, long tears and I just said, I'm so sorry that I failed you. And I said, what, what do I need to do? Um, so that year I went to, to Burning Man and I had a picture of her. And I went to the temple and they have this temple where everyone who died that year, you can put their photos up, you can put notes. And it is like, to me, the most sacred um, place that I see. And it, it's, it's built only for that event. And you go there and everyone's hush and quiet, or sometimes people break into song, or sometimes they play a very delicate guitar. And I went there and, and I sat down and I wrote her a letter. And in that letter I said, not only was, I'm sorry, I wish I could have done more, but I finally said what I really needed to say, which is I'm fucking angry at you. Why didn't you call me? Why, why didn't you at least tell us or reach out to someone? Like, it was okay for me to say that I was angry at her too. And that was, the sadness was easy to express, but the anger, that was the hardest thing to, to say. And I'm angry at you for, for taking yourself away from us um, and for not giving us another chance to help you. And, so finally, that just came out of my body, and I put it into the page. And uh, a young couple were there, and they said, you know, who did you lose? And I told them, I told them. And then they told me who they lost. And then we all just kind of naturally, without saying a word, just wrapped our arms around each other. And you could feel all of our hearts kind of pulsing in, the, in, our, in our limbs. And we just breathed, and we just held each other. And then finally, we just kind of let go, and we kissed each other's head. And we didn't exchange names or phone numbers or anything. We just went back off into the desert night. And a couple of days later, the temple burns. And so uh, 50,000 people gather around, and the temple lights on fire. And these huge flames go further up. And for the first time, I could see these tall flames. And they weren't the flames of hell. They were the flames mm -hmm. of release. Mm -hmm. Like, it wasn't that you were burning from sin. It was because you were burning away sadness, mistakes, attachments, and you can just see the embers floating away like like new stars going into the night. And so anyway, I came back, and um, I only had one little piece of her still left inside of me. And it wasn't the sadness, and it wasn't the grief, but it was the pleasure. And so I went up to the roof, and <laughs> flung the poncho open, and I saw the pinkness of the sky, and I just grabbed my cock, and, just like, and you know, when the sunrise happens, the sun actually comes up, and it's an optical illusion. The light of the sun actually hits the atmosphere, so you're seeing actually an image of the sun coming up, not actually the sun itself. And it felt a little bit like her, because I knew that it was an illusion, but it was okay to come anyway. There it is. Thank you.
I grew up with him. I knew him when I was 14. I knew him for 20 years, and that he was part of my sanctuary, my refuge. And to have that affect my identity and take it away, <coughs> you learn how to build sanctuary as friendship in different ways. And thank you for sharing that, because I know it's not easy, especially when it's your sense of identity and your gravity yeah. that begins to shift and change. So thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Survival, and it's based on Khalid Darar. Uh, his he basically explores the impact of modern day power struggles on ordinary citizens while seeking to maximize the social potential of artistic interventions. He is going to be selling his blood on Wall Street, so you can purchase. You can for a price. Yes. So we were thinking of what does it mean to commodify the body, blood and skin, for profit? survival, to promote an agenda, are you doing it to be noticed? The idea of sacrifice, being a martyr versus selling out, the thin line between prosperity and poverty. What isolated you from prosperity? Was it racial and ethnic identity, trauma, struggle, gender? What does it mean to own a piece of a person, buy someone's blood? Why would one want to? Who might actually? So if any of y'all, motivated to come on next month. We've also noticed moments of serendipity that happen in this series, and it's really wild to hear that the church was brought up twice yeah. in the very beginning, Religion. and then the Occupy Wall Street thing that's happening with the blood Occupy Wall Street. It's weird. It's just a little matrix. No, no, there's always a Neo walking around. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And also the sanctuary of the life you shed lives in the two readers who have gone so far. Like, with you, Nicholas, it's like people get to be their true selves, mm -hmm. and that is a rare moment mm -hmm. to be able to be just yourself and be fully embraced and accepted. So, thank you for that. We're going to have a little pee break and a small break. And whatever kind of break you want to have for 10 minutes, and we'll come back. So, I think we'll time. Uh, take the door. Back. So, we'll come back at 9.20.
Do like A or B. Like, wondering like what my own space looked like, 
space. And also, this room did not have a door, and so imagine a teenage girl knocking on the door. <laughs> 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 but, you know, we made it work, we made it work, and we spent a lot of time together, and I like her being the one to tuck me in, and, you know, us only being the one to say goodnight to each other. Um, and one of those nights was my last night with her, um, something I hid from my peers growing up, and ultimately from myself, is that my mom really struggled with drug addiction and, and alcoholism. And it was something that we both knew was happening in the house, we kind of danced around it, and we didn't bring it to the light. Um, and so when I lost her, I started talking to my grandma and my mom's friends in attempts to sort of piece together a full story and, and shape this whole woman. And what I came to realize is that, you know, this monster, this addiction that she battled with was, it was something that started before I came into the world. It was something she struggled with throughout her whole pregnancy. Um, and I bring that up to say that because of my mom's own trauma, her own lessons, her own pain, that she didn't have the tools to foster a sense of hope, right? And so like, even in her womb, like my first home, there was always this idea of displacement and like, me not belonging and like this sense of infiltration. So I came into the world with that. And you know, growing up we shared space, but the home didn't feel like that. And so when I lost home in the Bronx, I lost home in my mom, I had to figure out, you know, where home was. And in every sense of the word, like physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and I started looking for home in in school, in work, in relationships and other people, and it just kept going down like dead ends and nothing quite felt like it was enough. And um, like I know that we all don't have moms. Um, maybe your mom's passing away from um, or maybe you don't have a healthy relationship with her, but if you just think about like the archetype of a woman like mother, like she is unconditional love and, and grace and serenity and you know, she is your home. And so it really sucks to lose that. And losing mom sucks at any age, I can tell you, but you know, 18 is that strange transitional area where you know, you're not a child, but you're not an adult. So I don't feel like I had her long enough to um, build my own tools. And so after just making all these wrong turns on, on this journey to find home, I had to figure out what home meant um, rather than being inside of myself. And that took a lot of uh, rebuilding and demolishing the idea of what home was and totally restructuring. And I know that you know these concepts of self-love and self-care is very popular these days, and it's, it's kind of buzzwordy. Like it's a little commercialized. It's kind of annoying for the mic. Like it's reduced to like you know getting a manicure and then thirty dollars to buy a scented candle from Target. <laughs> I mean, like I like those things, especially Target. That's like, <laughs> part of my life, but it's just been so much deeper than that been this idea of, of, of rebuilding and, and renovating. Um, yeah, and so that took a lot of forgiving and, and letting go and just thinking about the idea of, you know, when you move from an apartment or a house to another, like, you don't take everything with you. You might leave on like, a shirt that doesn't fit or, you know, whatever doesn't resonate with you. And just this idea of leaving behind what doesn't serve you. Um, and so, yeah, ultimately I've been on this journey of building a bridge to find home in myself and leaving behind the homes that I don't want to live in. And I laugh every time I hear, you know that cliche quote about like home being my heart is? It's like so corny, but it's so true. And I feel like really corny saying that, but like that's where I found home and that's where I found myself. And so if you're looking for home and a sense of refuge and sanctuary, I hope that your journey leads you to your heart. So that is where I live now. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to leave you with a poem. Um, writing and poetry was definitely an important part of my childhood, and it's it's how I process emotions and, and made sense of the world. And this poem in particular was the first time I shared a poem off the page of a book. And I wrote it straight from the heart, straight from my new home. Like it's very raw, very vulnerable. And every time I perform it, it feels like letting people into my house. Thank you for coming to my housewarming party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, home was only three minutes, so you gotta go home after that. <laughs> <laughs> if you're an introvert, it's like the 
shortest party, I swear. Um, but yeah, welcome to my home. <laughs> this is the L word. <clears throat> One time on the first date, I made the mistake of saying the L word too soon. He looked over at me like I had just planted a single lily in his backyard without permission, dropped the jewel in his lap that he never asked for. One time on a first date, I made the mistake of saying the L word too soon. And by the L word, I mean loss. And by loss, I mean that my mother and I spent every night roads apart. That even though the nurse cut the umbilical cord when I was born, I was shown the true meaning of separation 18 years later. The irony of once hearing her say, I brought you into this world, I can take you out, but her choosing to leave instead. I didn't mean to run with the words mother and dead so early on, because I've seen how people contract, how they claw at an exit sign of a room that I never locked them inside of. My grief is a funny thing. Often it tells me to make myself small, as not to disturb the appetites of those around me, as if I'm not hungry too. Shape shift into a porcelain doll and forget how to move my own limbs. Put on my hair fires using my fingertips without screaming. Hack away at my lips so much to cover and hushed apologies. Make myself tired. But I'm tired of feeling like a contagious disease. A trigger warning etched permanently on my forehead. You can't catch this level of hurt for me because my pain is going to spurt the love I have for myself. It's the reason I'm still breathing. It's the reason I still choose to love so hard though half my heart sits in the box six feet underground. I don't need you to be my resting place, but I know how to feel my own way around when the lights go up. Now I come home to an empty house and greet the tattered photos lying beside my bed. I'm not afraid of the dark, or the demons I invited to my kitchen table. And people keep telling me that I'm strong, but some soldiers are just tired of going into battle, fighting for joy every time someone changes the subject over dinner. And they don't ask what her name was. When they ask about my father, and I say he left her before she left me, sometimes I want to rip out my tongue. If it means her ghost, and I want to hop the tip of it. I want to stretch my mouth into a poor smile, make me taste the black hole that sinks its teeth into anyone that gets too close. Maybe I should redefine the word trauma as an unconventional way to rediscover myself. A lifelong course to how to become an alchemist that transmutes shadows into light, suicide notes into Christmas cards, chalk outlines into some angels, is suffering in one hand and hope in the other, I become a wounded healer. You see, none of this is yours to hold, but I do wish someone would see how heavy this luggage is, asking where I'm going and if I need help getting there. But on the days I feel like giving up, I find a stranger, point to my scars and say, look, look at what I fucking survived. Thank you so much. <laughs>
bring you into this world. <laughs> no, seriously. And to keep you and love you as long as she could, that's a gift. So thank you for sharing thank your mother you. with us and that. story Philip said after the last couple days I feel like I should get more involved and my response was look what you're doing yeah, yeah. So like if you don't think that you're involved in a civic identity this is what you're you're doing right now to help your community heal mm -hmm. yeah. and and these stories are transformative they change lives people hearing other people's stories change their lives and people hearing the trajectory that other and people are going ends up changing their trajectory. And that's a that's how you're involved right now in this community. But well, we're doing it to go. Yes. Yes. try again. Finally, I was born into the 
American diaspora called Baltimore, America. What is a diaspora? I don't know. I'm only <laughs> this hot. <laughs> and we live on a half street. We live on 22nd and a half street. What's a half street? <laughs> Daddy said that they said that we are three fifth point. <laughs> and I think, is that why we live on a half street? <laughs> and this, this street, there are only houses on one side. And there's nothing on the other side. And this, this house that we live in, uh, it's not wired for electricity. And this is during the time of the Kennedy administration. And we're living with my uncle. And we move up the street to where one of the houses do have electricity. And I think my, my uncle wasn't used to getting an electric bill. <laughs> he moved back into the house that we lived in before. So after that time, my family moved out across on the other side of the main street. It's called Greenmount Avenue. And I guess it's poverty. You know, um, when you don't have money, or food, there's really nowhere for you. There's no place to go. So my family was quite nomadic. We lived all over East Baltimore. We moved so often. I remember one time we lived in a house for about maybe two weeks. And we never unpacked. And when you went up the steps, before you, before you hit the stairs, there was a big burn mark on the floor. And for some odd reason, we never went up the steps. We ran around the burn mark, and then we went up the steps. And we found out later that uh, a child had died there. And I think that's one of the reasons why we didn't live there long, because the spirit from that house was just uh, working my family. And like I said, we moved so often. I remember one time um, the moving men came and to uh, speed up the process, I helped them move the furniture out of the house <clears throat> onto the street. And it was interesting to see your furniture on the street. Because yeah, as a child, I was like, oh, we're decorating the street. <laughs> and I guess as you know, being an artist, I was like, yeah, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, you know, my sister grabbed me. Come on, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and this became sort of the ritual of my, my family. You know, we would go from house to house. And sometimes we didn't uh, stay ahead of the eviction. And uh, in Maryland, we called it uh, being set out, you know. And so we were, we were set out quite often. <clears throat> so it was during the uh, end of 10th grade. I moved out of my family's home. And I thought I was moving out of poverty, moving away from poverty. And I moved into the home of some white friends that were like 10 years older than me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when my high school counselor found out, he asked me, did I have to run in the house? And I said, I'm not a slave, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm living there. And my friends thought I was doing the woman of the house. And, um, and one of the reasons why I moved in with them, because they were socialists. And, uh, you know, they were from the college crowd. Uh, 
Um, but they were moving around. They were moving places outside of Baltimore, and I wanted to travel too. And I didn't let them know that was the whole reason why I, I, I did all this. You know, I got to leave Baltimore City, and they were coming to New York, and my thing was, I'm going to see the Empire State Building. <laughs> and they came for the May Day March. <laughs> Um, and, and amidst all this socialism, I noticed there was sexism in the house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being young and naive and not, not really knowing how to handle, uh, you know, reality, what people say, and what they do is two different things, yeah. you know, and I'm trying to hold them accountable to the whole socialism thing, mm -hmm. so I address it. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, one day I, I say to the dude, I said, you know, she spent all day cleaning the house and you came home and wrecked it at 15 minutes flat. Mm -hmm. And his response was, you know, I'll throw you and your shit out on the street. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked. I was not prepared. I was, I was totally not prepared to hear that, you know, and I didn't challenge it. I said, okay, and I walked away because I really didn't know what to do with it. But in the back of my mind was, I got to get out of here as soon as I can. And I was thinking I was in the house of an enemy. And, um, I didn't know what to do. And my mom called, and my mom never calls. By the time my mom called, I had moved out. And, um, and the woman, she never knew what had happened. So she told my mom, we, my mom, she didn't know where I was. Mm -hmm. And um, so I moved to Japan, to Japan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, living in Japan was great. It was wonderful. <laughs> I was outside of the country. I was outside of the restraints, all the things that they expected a black man to be. I would go to people and say, I can do that, and I have a job. So, you know, I was a DJ, <clears throat> producer at Consign Radio, and I had an expense account. I was decorating people's homes, I had an expense account. <laughs> And um, I was getting ready to get my black belt. So I was, I was living and, and loving, and I was experiencing things. And in, in my mind, I was like, wow, this is, must be what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. So when this expat, this American expat, came to me and said, uh, why don't you go to the English language school and teach English? Because they really need some teachers, man. And they're working us hard until they get these teachers. And I'm thinking to myself, I got this gone, I got that gone. I'm a legend in my own mind. <laughs> <laughs> so what would a legend want to teach English? <laughs> so he, he's real adamant, he's real desperate, and you know, He's a friend. So I was a good, the money is okay. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. So a week later, I'm downtown Osaka trying to find this school. I can't find it. I go to a pay phone, running a cell phone system, and I call the school. And I said, Mushi Mushi, go to San Desu. Tell excuse me, I'm lost. I'm the teacher trying to get there, fill that position. They give me directions. I'm running late, but I'm getting there. And you know, in Japan, everything runs on time. You know the, uh, the, the bullet train, the, the Shinkansen. If it's two minutes late, the conductor apologizes to the whole train. If it's 10 minutes late, 
best qualification for committing suicide. And everything runs in Japan. <laughs> and so um, I get to the school. I'm sitting in the office. A little bit more longer than I think I should be sitting in the office. But I'm sitting in the office. And I'm hearing all sorts of 99 this and 99 that and 99 this. And then finally somebody comes out. And they say, I'm sorry. The positions are taken. And I said, well, you know, I just called you. <laughs> you, you could have told me that then. You know, that was the case. And in, J in Japan, uh, language is such that uh, people don't really ever speak to it. You know, you can say, so this name, which means we agree. That's a yes. But the reality is, no. So if I say you're coming to the party, and they say, so this name, which means yes, that means you're not coming to the party, but you did not say so this is the language that we're speaking right now. Wow. <laughs> and you know, and I go, oh. So um, I go back home. I moved out of the city a while ago. So I go back home because I live out by the rice paddies. I specifically wanted to live there. I specifically wanted to live there because you know cherry blossom trees, mm -hmm. and there was a shrine. I, I was living in a picture postcard, mm -hmm. and so I went back home, slowly, just thinking, that what happened? What really happened? No, <laughs> that ain't what happened. No, I didn't. You know, and I'm, and I'm uh, you know, because uh, so I get home. And the phone is ringing. And I don't answer it. Because I'm just, I'm tore up. And I'm trying not to be. Because if, you know, if can't be, you know? So, I pick up the phone. And it's Brian. And um, he apologized. I don't say anything. He's apologizing. He says that the uh, director of the school was trained in California. I don't say anything. And he, he continues to apologize. And he, he says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because Timmy says, I'm, I'm sorry. That's all he says, I'm sorry. But I, I don't say anything. It's just pure silence. When I feel and I know he's still there because I can hear his breathing. And The sorry is just piled up to be sealed. That I could be drowned by it. I still don't say anything. And he's still just saying, I'm sorry. But I can't, I, I can't say anything because he appears. And I can't move in any direction. And I'm mad at myself. Because if I had been in America, that wouldn't have happened. Because I would have been prepared for it. I know what America is. I left home in the 10th grade. But I, I didn't have my radar with me. I left it home. I was free. So he said, I'm sorry. And every time he said, I'm sorry, a 
about I'm sorry about what can say? I'm sorry about I bow to my mother and father. I bow to black men chalked and outlined. I bow to every African American neighborhood red line. I bow to every family that didn't receive your letters in the mail. I bow to families that were sharecroppers and swindled or pushed into tumors of unworkable land. I bow and I've learned to look inside my heart to find to any people they opened themselves up to civilization, but only found wounds. Mm -hmm. I for me. I bow for you. Like yours, like mine. Show up on Thanksgiving, we're fine. Should we dress up for the Halloween? It is your season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking we should dress up. So, guys, <laughs> come back. Well, that being said, thank you everyone thank so much you. for coming out. Yeah.